The term for the morning is the word wave. W-A-V-E. That's one of those words in the English language of which there are probably thousands upon thousands that drive those who come to the States from foreign cultures, drives them crazy in trying to learn English. I've over the years had a, a lot of occasion to get to know those who've come from all corners of the globe, and uh, many of them tell me in the process of learning English the extraordinary difficulties of grasping this language. Lots of reasons. Grammatically, there are like hundreds and thousands of exception clauses to all kinds of rules, and there's not much form. And, and words become another problem. Because in the English language, the same word can have so many meanings. And often the meanings and definitions have nothing to do with each other. And so they're trying to learn vocabulary, and then the word they think they're using is the wrong one, but it's just traumatic. We have no clue. Unless you've been from another world, another culture, trying to learn this nutty language called English. Right? Camille's already, he's already, he's already laughing hysterically. Boy, did I ever hit that spot on, huh? He's thinking of all the occasions he's done that. With, uh, uh, I, 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 I've talked to Chinese friends and Korean friends and Japanese friends, especially the Asian languages. Learning, learning English is an absolute nightmare, and that's one of the reasons why. And you're wondering, what in the world is wrong with this guy? Where is he going with this? Sign me up in one of those rooms, you know, make a reservation. The word is wave. Now, I found at least a half a dozen different definitions of the word wave. Many of them have nothing to do with each other, some of them remotely. Okay, let's start. You got the ocean wave, right? That's the one that appeals to me the most, so I start there. Especially come the, the winter time. When you know you, 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 maybe I don't know about you, but I, I, I've grown up from the time I was an infant in the summers living with my family on the Jersey Shore. And so the ocean has always been very much connected to me, heart and soul. And there's something magical to me about the ocean wave. It, 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 it is alluring, peaceful, restful. You know, it's just sometimes you can just kind of unwind. It's a stress reliever. Anybody else feel the same way? Just the, in fact, I know a lot of people, it was something that I, in clinical uh, clinical counseling, a lot of my colleagues would use this as a, a, a tool for help for those who had struggles with anxiety, especially when it was worse at night. They would introduce these CDs, and you just play them kind of through the, the, your stereo player, maybe softly in your bedroom. And one of the ones that was extraordinarily relaxing, just the sound of gently coming ocean waves. Just not, not, not hurricane waves. You, know, you, you don't want to play that tape because that just puts them in a place where they have to be hospitalized. You know, the, but just that soothe. It's, 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 it's isn't it beautiful. Just feel like just, you're ready to go to sleep now. I can see it happening. Didn't take much. Now I'll give you an excuse for falling asleep. So you got, you got that, that meaning, the, the ocean waves. There's one. And then there's, I guess, it's kind of closely connected a metaphor that you'll find in, in football stadiums and baseball stadiums. And, and you already know where I'm going, right? Where, you know, sections of the park, you stand up with the arms up all together, and then you go back down, the next section goes. And if you look at it from a distance, it has kind of the appearance of this amazing wave that is occurring within the stadium, right? There's that wave. Try to communicate that to somebody coming from an Asian culture. They're looking for water in the stadium. And what do you mean wave? And then there's the greeting wave, right? The, the greeting. It's the way you say hello. And, and, and they're all kinds of doing that. If you want to get somebody's attention, maybe it's, you know, it's like jumping jacks. Hey, I'm over here. What? Or just, there's all kinds of waves, right? The, the, there's the bold wave. Hey, how are you doing? Or there's the shy wave. There's, you know, little, or maybe the British royal regal wave. You know, you know, the slight turn of the wrist. 
Wait, and that really gets messed up because waves in the Western culture not only mean hello, they also mean goodbye. And so if there's somebody you see in the mall, you may be waving goodbye, I don't care if you don't see me, and they'll never know. No. See, you already go, look what's happening with the word wave. And, and then you got a lot more than that. There is the moment that maybe you don't like when maybe you're suddenly feeling a little ill. Now, now Abe felt this when, when the cake came out this morning. He kind of felt, he felt like a little lightheaded, like all the blood was draining. I, had, I was standing next to him hoping he didn't pass out. You get this wave that comes over you, right? Sometimes you're getting sick suddenly. And you, that's not a, a fun wave. That's not like the ocean wave, you know, the, the opposite. Emotion. You get that kind of a wave, right? Kind of comes over you, sweat, or whatever. Then you get the scientific waves, don't you? Sound waves, Ooh. motion waves, and kind of used in, in scientific terms. And there are others beyond that. It's remarkable how one word can have so many different meanings. Imagine if you're someone from another world trying to learn just the one word. Oh, talk about a migraine. And now we're adding a new definition to the word wave that the Hebrews practiced thousands of years ago. All connected with feast number five. See, there is sanity to my insanity. It is a word that was we read in Leviticus 23 that showed up several times, both in preparation for this fifth and final feast, and during the fifth and final feast. The Hebrew feast is called Shavuos, the Hebrew word meaning weeks, because it occurred seven weeks, or 50 days after the Passover is concluded, seven weeks later. It is the second of the spring feasts. Not like the fall feasts that all three of them occurring within a two-week time span. You got Rosh Hashanah or Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, and then ten days later is Yom Kippur, then five days later is Sukkot, the Tabernacles. That's all within a two-week span, pretty quick. Now you got the spring feast five months later, Passover, and Shavuos, week seven weeks, 50 days, you've got seven weeks later, almost two months, the final feast. It is similar to Sukkot, the third feast of the fall, which was also kind of an in-gathering feast. Remember, they're building the, the booze, the little tabernacles, and they're celebrating the fall harvest. God's our provider. God protected us in the wilderness. He is Jehovah Jireh, God our provider, who not only provides for us in the fall harvest, but he's provided for us the spiritual harvest of forgiveness that we remembered because of repentance at Rosh Hashanah, redemption at Yom Kippur, and now we are rejoicing. In the Sukkot, in the booze, God's our provider. Physically, spiritually, he's the great provider. The same theme repeats itself five to six months later. Passover, the, the lamb, sacrificial lamb. God is our provider. There is repentance and there is redemption and there is rejoicing all during the Passover. Kind of like all three themes are wrapped together in that one celebration of eight days. But seven weeks later... The rejoicing theme, the harvest theme for the spring comes all over again. That's where the term wave comes to play. It's bizarre. Because the specific instructions that we read together in Leviticus chapter, uh, chapter 23, you see the, the term appearing in verse 12. You're going to gather this, this sheaf of of wheat or, or barley, the the the, uh, the grain feast, and you're going to kind of put it together in a sheath. And and with the offering, the the the, uh, the instruction is to to wave this thing. Verse 12: On the day when you wave the sheath, there's another animal offering, and it appears appears again down in verse verse 17. During this Shavuos, this feast of of, uh, of weeks, you're going to bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread. 
in the form of waves, and, and the priests are going to take this, and they're waving it before the Lord. Weird. Kind of like Old Testament charismatics. Like, uh, uh, what, what, what is this? Bizarre stuff going on. Waves waving. And, and they're given to the priests, because remember, as the land is established, what didn't the priests have that everybody else had? They didn't have their own land. Yeah, all the, all the others had tribes, had, had land to, to harvest. The priests working in and around the temple area, they didn't have their own land to grow their own harvest, and so it was the responsibility that God built in for the people to provide for all the priests. And so that was part of the offering the percentage that was given to them, so they did their own baking, they had all their own supplies. It was part of their provision for those who served them. But waving these strange stuff, what in the world going on here? Well, I think you'll be intrigued as we put this together. This feast, the, the, the feast of Shavuos weeks, in, in the Greek Pentecost, Penta 50, 50 days after Passover. That's already ringing a bell for us, isn't it? We'll get to that in a, in a little bit. This feast has multiple titles. Moses referred to it in the books of the law in Exodus and Deuteronomy and Numbers on multiple occasions as part of the instruction that God gave to him to tell the people about these five feasts. I'm just going to take you to one other reference because I want you to see the different titles that are used to describe Shavuos in addition to the Feast of Weeks. Just turn back briefly, then we'll go back in Levit Leviticus in a moment. Turn back to Exodus chapter 23. Here is an illustration of how this, uh, this term is used and the different titles that are used to describe this particular feast. Exodus chapter 23 and uh, down around verse 16. You can find other references in Exodus, a couple of them in Deuteronomy, some in Numbers. You can do those references on your own if you want them later. Let me know. I'll give them to you. Here in Exodus 23 verse 16, one illustration of about six of them in the Law of Moses. It'll do the trick. You shall observe the feast of the harvest. That was another title used for Shavuos, Feast of Weeks. It was a harvest feast because it's celebrating the spring harvesting of the crop. It was also called the feast of the harvest of the first fruits. It was the feast of the first fruits, because now it's the first of the land fruits that you're drawing in the spring of your wheat harvest, your barley harvest, all that's there to provide your, your grain. So it was called the feast of the harvest, the feast of first, pr first fruits. And notice next in the verse, from which you shall show the field, also the feast of ingathering. Makes sense, doesn't it? The farmers, all three fit this this feast, feast of the harvest, feast of the first fruits that you're drawing from the land, feast of the ingathering, Shavuos, feast of weeks, all of those referring to this same great Hebrew festival. Now we got, before we take a quick look of, of its meaning and reference, and really its messianic fulfillment. That's powerful. We need to put the package of the five together briefly. We'll do it more next week. I already alerted you last week to something that seems to show up, and that is, whereas you and I have a distinct advantage believing in Jesus, we have the indwelling Spirit of God within us to proke us, to prod us, to remind us of all that we need to be thankful for in Jesus. He is always within, guiding us into all truth, bringing all things to our remembrance. He's kind of like that spiritual calendar from within. That convicts us when we're out of step, that drives us to know to confess our sin because he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to wash us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That all ha it happens from within. He's there. It's one of the reasons why those who know Jesus as Lord and Savior and those who don't sometimes have a hard time connecting. And those who don't know Jesus and his forgiveness look at us many times like 
we have a few screws loose. Because they just don't get it. They can't. Uh, unless God shines light or brings them to the light, they're not going to get it. Jesus told us that. John the Apostle did in John chapter 1. Jesus became light in the world, but the world loved darkness rather than light. Darkness didn't comprehend the light. They didn't get him. Why are we going to expect they're going to get us? Unless the Spirit of God is drawing in that process, opening up eyes. Not going to get So we have that distinct advantage. In the Old Covenant, there is no indwelling present ministry of those who are believing God's temporal provision for forgiveness of sin. So God builds in these calendars, and it's like he's doing it twice a year. Right? The fall feasts, sounding of the trumpets, at repentance time. Every time they heard those trumpets at the beginning of the fall season, Yom Teruah, the, the Feast of the Trumpets, later Rosh Hashanah, when they're rebuilding after the, the captivity and exile, they're recognizing it's time for soul searching. It's time for me to take a look within to realize all that I've done that's displeased the Lord. And, and ten days, God's mercy allowing them to deal with those issues. And then finally comes Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, High Priest, one day during the year, all that we went through, sacrifice into the Holy of Holies, blood of the Lamb, somber, sober, introspective, that God would, would temporarily cover all of my sin for the past year. And then five days later, having come through that somber period, a time to just settle down, and then comes a celebration, Sukkot. You're my provider, not only physically, like you did in the wilderness to our ancestors, but, but spiritually. You're the provider of forgiveness. And so we give thanks. Because you are Jehovah Jireh. You are a God of mercy, grace, and love, and, and forgiveness. Even repeated over and over again, temporally, the, the three fall feasts remind us of that. And then you got the spring feast. Five weeks later, well, here it is again. The Passover brings it all together, right? Repentance. Redemption, rejoicing, celebration in God's provision of the Lamb, blood shed, judgment will pass over you. All of that was a reminder of forgiveness, which is why Jesus used that great feast when he introduced what we call the Lord's Supper, or communion, our terms, churchianity terms, not biblical terms. But it was the Passover with greater meaning, new covenant. New meaning of the cup of redemption. New meaning of the matzah, the unleavened bread. Speaks of who he is and what he did for us so that we would rejoice in God's provision for forgiveness. And you notice both Jesus and the Apostle Paul reminded us, we're not setting this on a calendar. It's not any longer a once-a-year celebration like at Passover. Paul said, as often as you do this, 1 Corinthians 11, do this in remembrance of me. You notice he didn't put it on the calendar timetable? Intentionally. Because in believers in Jesus, we don't need a calendar set. Okay, it's, we do it once a month. It's just a practice, a tradition. Doesn't mean anything other than the fact that that's when we choose to do it. There's no once a month thing anywhere in Scripture. There's not even once a week thing. Or every other week. It's whatever you do. Whenever you know that as the Spirit of God in you is prompting you to, to just give attention to who He is and what He's done for you and to celebrate, do it. And, and your heart drives you to the upward focus and the outward focus and just to remember who He is and what He's done. There's all the Passover. And I'm struck that the Passover, as we dealt with it last week, that brings everything together. You know, there's repentance, and there's redemption, there's rejoicing, and in the festival of the Passover, it's all there. You'd think that there would be no other need. It really strikes me in the calendar, it's kind of bizarre. It's not five days or a week later, but it's seven weeks later. Fifty days, close up to two months Later comes this springtime for harvesting. And the harvesting is taking place during the, you know, kind of the weeks before leading up to and then culminating in this extraordinary final feast, Shavuos, in-gathering harvest celebration. 
it, similar to Sukkot, the fall harvest, here's the spring harvest, and we're once again seeing God utilizing the physical image of land harvesting, crop harvesting, to remind the Israelites that he is Jehovah Jireh, their provider, not just for what they physically need from the land, but from what they spiritually need from heaven. His grace and mercy and forgiveness. But it's seven weeks later. It's almost like God's saying, you just had your great Passover feast and now it's life as usual, isn't it? And it's like seven weeks later, God's like tapping them on the shoulder in the calendar and saying, did you forget already? It hadn't even been two months. Are you still celebrating my grace, my mercy, my love, my faithfulness, my provision, my covering over of your sin? Are you still thankful? Are you still celebratory? Are you still grateful? Are you still worshipful? Are you? Seven weeks was kind of a wake-up call to where God wanted them to be constantly in their spiritual journey. Never to forget who he is and what he did for them. So they needed it for a constant calendar reminder. God would desire the exact same thing for you and for me without a calendar reminder. Because if we've come to faith in Jesus, believing in him, we have his indwelling presence. He journeys with us every moment of the day. His presence within his spirit, bearing witness with my spirit that I am a child of God, he would have me to always be in that state of gratefulness, of contemplation, of reflection, of meditation, of wonder. That he is Jehovah Jireh. He is God, our provider. So quickly, the biblical celebration from Leviticus 23 that we read together a few moments ago. You noticed with me the connection with the, 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 the ingathering, the harvest of the ingathering, the, the, the spring harvest of, of, the, of the crop is connected to the Offering of sacrifices. Did you see that? The, the, we wove that together, both in the, the days leading up to and during this Pentecost Shavuos seven weeks later. Why? God is connecting the provision of the ground with the provision of heaven. He's making the connection. Yeah, I've given you all this grain. I've given you the, the, the fruit of the harvest. I've provided for you physically. But the reason I'm doing that is to show you that I'm a provider of much greater things than just grain. It's not only about life here. It's not just your physical sustenance. You desperately need spiritual life in me. I am the provider of your forgiveness. And so the sacrificial animals and lambs that are offered alongside of this, you know, the, the, the grain and all that's done is to be reminded how desperately they need his forgiveness constantly. But that's there. And we noted that repeated theme over and over again. Verse 21, it's a proclamation, it's my appointment with you, it's a holy convocation, a, a holy gathering, a special Sabbath, no labor, no work, perpetual offering every every year. This is to go on and on, not just when you first come into the land, but always. It's all there. But here's a strange instruction about the sheaves of of wheat given to the priests, two of them, get that still, two of them? We're not going to forget that. We're coming to that. Two of them, that they're, they're waving before the Lord. What in the world does that all mean? And two of them, what, what, what's that all about? 
They're doing it. Told us to do it. He doesn't give any interpretive rationale anywhere in the Old Covenant for the meaning of that. None. No, Nowhere. Not here in Leviticus 23. Not in the Numbers 28-29 passage. Not in the Exodus when Moses preaches it. There is not one single solitary Old Testament explanation for what that was supposed to signify. Not a thing. I kind of get the fact that the waving, the taking the, the sheaves and, and upward, you can kind of get some of the spiritual image, right? You, you're the one who's given this to us. We're, we're kind of showing you that we're appreciating that you're the one who's given us the harvest. You're the giver of, of those wonderful gifts, and, and we're grateful. So we're, we're saying it's not because we've labored and we've worked hard and we've done this and we've earned this and we're great farmers and we're great handles of the land. It's all about it. No, no, no. You're the provider. We depend on you. We can get that part. That makes some sense, right? That's kind of obvious. When you get to the last part here, you'll see something that will explode that Jesus used to put it all together. But there is the, the biblical celebration. Now, secondly, concerning the historical celebration... Interesting that other than the, the, the sermons of Moses, the Exodus a couple of times, Deuteronomy a couple of times, Numbers a couple of times, Leviticus, other than this initial instruction of what they're supposed to do, where the other feasts we kind of saw some, some key points where a lot of them are observed, especially when they're kind of coming back to the land after the captivity, they're, they're instituting the feasts again. We saw that. In Ezra, in Nehemiah, we, there is no reference anywhere in the Old Testament, to Shavuos, Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, to the, the Feast of the Ingathering, the Harvest, the First Fruits, no evidence anywhere in the Old Covenant of them celebrating it. You would assume, since some of the others are referenced after the return from captivity in Nehemiah and in Ezra, that it's likely that that was also practiced, but we just don't have anything written, at least not in the Old Testament. But we have a real key statement in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, that tells us that apparently this remained a major feast of observance for the Jews. So I want to take you under this historical celebration. Turn with me to the book of Acts in the 20th chapter, and here's a fascinating reference. Acts chapter 20, it is the only place we can go to. Well, one of two. Acts chapter 20, indicating that this was a, a major observance. Acts chapter 20, we'll get to it in, um, in uh, verse 16. If we're reading the verse, Shavuos, Feast of Weeks, in gathering Harvest, one of three feasts of the five that was required by the Lord of all Hebrew men to observe. Three of the, I mean, they basically participate in all of them, but three are specifically highlighted, Passover being one, this one being another, and we noted in the fall feast, the third one, the Feast of Sukkot or Tabernacle, was the required one of the three, because it presumed that they were already there for the time of, of offering of sacrifice and were there to celebrate. God was more concerned the Israelites lived in light of the truth of their forgiveness than he was in their going through the motions. And so the two feasts of rejoicing are the ones that are especially noted as being required, and Shavuos was one. Notice this statement here in Acts chapter 20. It's the third missionary journey of Paul. The third of three. So he's already gone through first journey, Asia Minor. Church is established in Asia Minor, but it's now Turkey. And in the Galatian region and some of the others, they're kind of settling some churches there. Second journey kind of takes them into Europe, right? Northern northern Greece, Macedonia, southern Greece, Achaia, and you got Philippi and Thessalonica and our namesake, Berea. And down south you got you got um, Corinth and you can see you got you got the first two journeys in and the third journey a lot of revisiting to encourage, to teach, to to instruct, to appoint leaders, elders in the churches. And as he comes toward the end of this third global trip. 
He's making his way back east, heading from west to east from Europe. But there's a time constraint that he believes is significant that causes him to alter his plans and not go directly first to Asia Minor to Ephesus, where there was such significant church planning challenges in Ephesus, but rather to travel to a, a major seaport to the south of Ephesus that was a traveling port that took them from Asia Minor to Jerusalem, a time just to kind of stay briefly and change ships and head back to Jerusalem, where he would meet with the leadership from Ephesus, call them to meet him. And the reason stated in Acts 20.16, it's kind of interesting. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus in order that he might not have to spend time in Asia because he knew if he went to Ephesus, he would also have to go to the other churches that were already established on in, in Turkey and Asia Minor, and that's going to mean months of additional time spent there. What is it that drove him to conclude I really don't have the time to be able to spend months in Asia. You see in verse 16? He was hurrying, shortening the trip, in order to get to Jerusalem by what? By Shavuos, the feast of the ingathering, the feast of the harvest, the feast of first fruits. He felt compelled to be in Jerusalem during that feast. Which tells us a whole lot. It tells us a lot of what had been going on for generations previous. This was a major feast that the Hebrews followed. Major feast. It was just customary. It was, it was one he wanted, he felt obliged to be in Jerusalem. I'm sure they used it as a great evangelistic tool because, it, once again, you've got so many who were there, and that's exactly what happened some years before that we'll get to in a few moments, as a great evangelistic tool. And he wanted to be there. Especially to remember what had occurred years earlier, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Here's the other reference to Shavuos, the Feast of Weeks, Harvest, Ingathering, First Fruits. Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. It had been seven weeks since the crucifixion of Jesus. Seven weeks. Give a week or so of Jesus' resurrection appearances maybe a couple of weeks or so. More than that. We know it was a week later he first appeared to the apostles in the upper room, then a week later when Thomas was there. So you got maybe a week to two weeks there, and then he tells them, you know, I'll, I'll meet you up in Galilee, and they travel up to Galilee where he kind of has that last appearance. Remember the fish fry with Peter, do you love me? It's likely from there, Acts chapter 1, the ascension took place from the Galilee area. And Jesus says, uh, I'm out now, I'm leaving now. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the other parts of the earth. And so after Jesus ascends from Galilee, the guys travel back down to Jerusalem from Galilee. Don't know how long that trip took or how long it took them to get to Galilee. But you likely got, you know, several weeks or more of, of appearances. So now they're back in Jerusalem, and they're hanging out. They're, they were used to having Jesus around before the cross, and they were starting to get used to having Jesus around after. He's just kind of showing up. But they knew he wasn't going to show up again because of his last words when he was taken up. But, but they're hanging on to his promise. You're going to have a moment in Jerusalem where something dramatic is going to happen. So go there and wait. Put it waiting. Don't know for how long. Could have been weeks. Wondering. In Acts chapter 2 and, and verse 1, while they're gathered together, waiting, 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 
when the day of Pentecost had come. The day of Shavuot. The day of the Feast of the Ingathering, the Feast of the Harvest, the Feast of First Fruits. The day, lo and behold, look what happens. The supernatural invasion of God in the person for the first time of God, not the Son, but the third person of the triune God, God the Holy Spirit, who for the first time takes residence inside, indwelling, sealing, immersing the apostles as followers of Jesus, a first-time occurrence that had never occurred before. And to affirm that sign and wonder, they are supernaturally enabled to speak in the dialects of the people who came from the outward regions of the Hellenistic world, from all over the place, and all of those dialects are even identified in Acts chapter 2 and uh, verses 9 and 10 and 11, just a selection of some of the regions they came from. Remember, all the apostles were native Judean Jews. They spoke Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. Trilingual. That was life. But Jews who came from the outermost regions, from Asia Minor and Europe, to come for the Feast of Pentecost, by the way, that also tells us this was a feast that they heartily observed. They all came from all over the place for this great feast, obeying God. So they, apparently they were pretty faithful. And here they are coming in, and the miracle given to the apostles... They were speaking in languages, two words there, glossolalia, known languages, and dialectos, from which we get our word dialect. They were miraculously, as Judean Jews, given the supernatural ability to preach the truth of who Jesus is and why he came to a dialect that they did not know. They only knew Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. They did not know anything about the dialects of the Parthians, the Medes, the Elamites, the Mesopotamians, the, the Cappadocians, the ones from Pontus and Galatia, or Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, and Egypt, and Libya, and the Cyrus. They didn't know any of those dialects, but that's what they're doing. And no wonder when they looked at them, they thought, these guys are either lunatics or they're drunk. Can we have some of that stuff too? And That happened on the day of the ingathering. And Peter's sermon on that day is there for us in Acts chapter 2. Preaching the life, the person, the ministry of who Jesus was and what he did. The God who came from heaven incarnate, the one who was the Messiah filling all the messianic prophecies, the one who came to be the final lamb, the one who came to be the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the one who came to be the once and for all sacrifice, who died according to David's prophecy and the prophets, who rose again and ascended. The one that they are all witnesses of. He, Peter, lame old Peter, supernaturally empowered from the inside out by the indwelling Spirit of God, preaches that message, and we have in the end of chapter 2, there are thousands who repent of their sin and place their faith in Jesus. That is pretty remarkable. He had never preached before. It was his first sermon. But the Spirit of God's transformation in the life of Peter became really evident, didn't it? He's just an uneducated man. How in the world did he pull that off? What happened? Thousands. It only refers to 3,000. That's the men. We don't know how many of the women and children. Later, another sermon. Thousands more. you got thousands upon thousands of new believers in Jesus who occur, and all that occurs within a, within a matter of days surrounding the Feast of the Ingathering the Feast of a Harvest, the Feast of First Fruits. Are we making connections yet? So here is the Messianic significance. And Jesus was setting them up for this all along. They just didn't know it. Way back at the beginning of his ministry, way back, 
Remember early on only John records in John chapter 4 of Jesus traveling with the, 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 the bunch of guys after the Passover. They had to go up to, up to Samaria. Remember that? But we had to, we had to go through, or had to go up to Galilee, but they end up going through Samaria instead of around, and that flipped them out. And they're at the well. Remember the woman at the well? Remember that home? That whole thing? And her life is radically changed while these guys are trying to find corned beef and pastrami sandwiches in the village, hard to find in Samaria, but they're looking for kosher corned beef and pastrami. That's my interpretation. Give me a break, will you? And, and they're, and they're, they're bringing the food back. They have no idea what's going on. She's leaving. They have no clue what just happened. And Jesus encounter with this woman, and he brings her to a place of first fruit. He brings her into his harvest. He brings her to spiritual life. There is an in gathering in a unkosher Samaritan. And she goes back into the village. And while they're having the meal and they're asking questions and Jesus is trying to explain to them what happened, suddenly he points over his shoulder down the road. He had previously said, don't you guys know that you plant the seed and after months, there is a harvest. That's what the celebration is all about. They were anticipating Shavuos. They had just left, right? To go to Galilee for Passover. He's talking Shavuos language. He's talking the feast to come language. God's a provider. And seed gets planted and there's a harvest. Oh, wait a minute, guys. Check this out. Yeah, I haven't even been four months. Just check down the road a piece. Look what's happening. And there are all these men coming out of the village, many of whom she had, let's just say, become acquainted with. And here they are making their way toward Jesus at the well. And she's leading them out to introduce them to Jesus. Remember Jesus' statement, John chapter 4, verse 35. Look, guys, look. The field is ripe for harvesting. This is what harvesting is all about. This is what first fruits all about. This is what in gathering is all about. It's all about the life that I want to really give. As the physical harvest gives you physical life, I have come to give you spiritual hmm. And then comes the rules. He did this kind of stuff over and over again in his ministry. John chapter 6, I am the bread of life. I am the source of your spiritual sustenance and life. As food gives you physical life, only I can give you spiritual life. So the day of Pentecost is a day where God is producing a harvest and an ingathering of spiritual life to show the ultimate meaning and fulfillment of that feast that most of the Hebrews never got. But now it explodes with new meaning. But we still got those waving sheaves, don't we? I didn't know. I don't remember my name, but I didn't forget that. That was supposed to be a bad joke, but it obviously, obviously was real bad. Hmm. How about 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Hmm. 
and uh, maybe verse 20. Here's Shavuos language. Here's Feast of Harvest ingathering language. Concerning the resurrection of Jesus, see? Now Christ has been raised from the dead, the what? First fruits, first ingathering of those who have died. Oh my goodness. Since by a man came death, by a man also came resurrection of the dead. As in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, the first ingathering, the first wave. And after that, those who are Christ's at his coming, the second wave. Two waves. Spiritual life and eternal life. Spiritual life and resurrection life. Christ's resurrection, our future hope in our resurrection. Two waves. Whoa. What an intricate God in this plan that begins to blossom so much later. To us, the challenge is the question of whether or not we are still later rejoicing in what God has done in your heart and mind if we've come to him by faith. It may not be seven weeks, it may be seven days, it may be seven years, or 70 years. But are you rejoicing in the life and hope that he has given you that's only found in Jesus? Do you know for absolute certainty because you have turned from your sin and you have placed your whole faith in Jesus for who he is and what he accomplished for you? He is that lamb. He is that atonement for sin once and for all. And you know, one, you have spiritual life. You've been born from above. And two, you have the certainty of eternal life. And you're looking forward to that next wave. Next wave that's going to take us upward. And there won't be crashing back down again. Rejoicing in God's spiritual provisions. Ephesians 1, 3, the words of Paul, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. There's our Shavuos. Are we a people of God redeemed by faith in the Son of God, in the Lamb of God, who knows that every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no shifting shadow or variance? That's James chapter 1 and verse 17. Or are we those, as Paul would write ironically to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 3 as he's praying for them, he prays verse 16 of Ephesians 3, according to God's riches and glory, that we would be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. See, that's where the transformation occurs from the inside out. So that Christ might dwell in our hearts through faith, and that being rooted and grounded in his loving provision, we might be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, the depth, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that we might be filled up to all the fullness of God. That should be rejoicing. Or we'll quit with the last one. First Peter chapter 1, Peter's words. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope, spiritual life, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. First fruit. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, reserved for you in heaven. 
So they needed it on a calendar. And you and I are living epistles with the truth of the gospel inscribed on the letter of our hearts. Is that true for you? Does your spirit bear witness with his spirit that you in fact are, by his work in us, you know you're a child of God? And John says, Beloved, it does not appear yet what we shall be, but we know when he appears we shall be like him. Because we're going to what? See him. There's two ways. His resurrection, our resurrection. Spiritual life, eternal life. You holding up both ways? That's your gift to me. It's your provision to me. It's heaven's entrustment to me. It's life you've given to me. Nobody else understands that truth but those who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Reason for rejoicing and reason for proclaiming. God, help us to be certain in this moment that we are part of that spiritual ingathering and harvesting. That life that only Jesus can provide of forgiveness and cleansing, spiritual life that comes by repentance and faith in him alone. May we be certain in this moment that we are yours, knowing you are only hope for both spiritual life and eternal life. Knowing with certainty that we will follow Jesus, who is the first fruits, and we will in that day be raised from the dead incorruptible. Lord God, may that be our hope, our joy, our confidence, our certainty, our expectance, and our message to declare. Thank you. Thank you that we can always be in that place of thanking you that you have harvested us, that we are among those who are your ingathering, your fruit of life, a product of your grace, your mercy, your love that we could never repay you for. Lord, may we be certain of that place with you as we come with gratefulness in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.